In order to tell this story, I'm going to stop, start at the end and then go back to the beginning. In 1997, uh, I uh, kind of blew up at Donna's grandson. Uh, did more than blow up, I went ballistic. And I came down on him pretty hard. And as a result, uh, Donna left the next day, and it so happened the following day, uh, Charlene and Alan showed up at my house, but I wouldn't answer the door. <clears throat> Donna came back that night, and uh, I thought I'd lost her for sure, but uh, such wasn't the case, and as we sat and talked, she says, "What well, you, you need help you should go and see somebody who's a psychoanalyst. I was already going to the VA, uh, being taken care of for other ailments that I had. And uh, so the next time I went to the VA, I talked to my nurse practitioner who was in the, the primary care where I went, and I said, I'd like to see a psychoanalyst. And she said, you don't have to make an appointment for this. You just go over to building 47 and walk in and say you'd like to see, talk to somebody, psychoanalyst or something. But just say what you've told me. So I did. And when I went there, I took Donna with me. And uh, building 47 is a, a building which uh, I like to compare to the temple. Because as soon as you go in there, you got kind of a peaceful feeling. It's just chuck full of uh, psycho psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, social workers, people who want to hear your story and want to, to help you. So I walked up to the desk and I said, I'd like to see a psycho psychoanalyst. And they said, just have a seat. So I sat down and in five minutes I was in an office talking to a guy. I don't know whether he was a psychologist or psychiatrist or what he was. But he said, uh, tell me about the war. Now, you kids know that I never talked about the war when you were growing up. I, you knew that I'd been a prisoner of war. Uh, you could tell that I'd been wounded because you saw the scars on my back when we'd go to the, the, uh, the beach. But that's about all you knew. Uh, you knew that I was pretty, uh, pretty mean sometimes. Uh, can't complain to his mother about why is dad so mean? And she told him, uh, well, he was in the war and he was a prisoner of war and he put up with some pretty bad things. And that's, that was all she'd say. Now you gotta remember that your mother went through this war the same as I did. Because we were sweethearts before I went overseas. And we wrote letters back and forth. And she, uh, she knew exactly, well not exactly, but she knew what I was going through as I was fighting with the infantry. Okay, back to the Building 47. This man told, said, tell me about the war and what happened, and I talked to him for an hour and a half. He said, well, we'll be in touch with you. And the next thing I knew, I received an appointment to come see a, a Dr. Phil Christensen. And he's a psychologist. And I went in to see him, and he said the same thing. Tell me about the war. And once again, I told him about the war, and I cried. And I did, uh, just when I'd get to certain parts, I'd cry. And because of losing some of my best friends. <laughs> and there was nothing I could do about it. And when I got through talking to him, 
And I, I said, so what, what's the matter with me? What's wrong with me? About a minute and a half went by and then he said, you were never deprogrammed before you came out of the service. Well, I could agree with that. And uh, he said, I want to see you again next week. Well, I received another appointment to see a, a, a young lady by the name of Mitzi Wasserstein. She only stands about five foot tall. Uh, cute little girl. And she's a psychiatrist. And she'd heard my story too. I talked to her for about an hour and a half. I told her about Shirley and I told her about a lot of things in my life besides the war. And she's the one that prescribed a medication for me to take. And I would see her on a weekly basis too. And then after this went on for a while, Phil asked me if I wanted to go into a group. And I said yes. So then I joined a group of men who were World War II veterans and or Korea, Korean veterans. So now let's go back to the beginning. When the war broke out in 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, December the 7th, 1941, I was in high school. I was a senior in high school. I turned 18 the following February. When I went to school the next day, uh, all of the boys in my class uh, were talking about the Japanese attacking us, Pearl Harbor and attacking America. We wanted to pay them back. So all the boys, all the young men my age, remember now we're only 17, uh, wanted to get in this right away. And some of them did, they quit school. Well, you all know that I had rheumatic fever when I was 16 and it left me with a slight heart murmur. So anyway, I finished my schooling as most of the boys did. We finished our schooling and then we be I began the process of trying to enlist in one of the services. Nobody would take me. Now, here I am in Magna. Uh, most of my friends have now gone off to war and I'm still there. It's not a very good feeling to have that thing Thing happened to you. I fought with the draft company. They changed my classification to 1A and within a couple of weeks I was drafted into the Army. Now, as soon as I got into the Army I took uh, tests to determine where I would be best suited in the Army. Well I wasn't a dummy. I, was, I graduated with a college education low, uh, uh, diploma, preparatory diploma, and so when I took the test, then they said, you're going to go into the ASTP. We're going to send you to Fort Benning, Georgia, and you'll take your basic training down there. The ASTP was called the Army Specialized Training Program, which meant that after your basic training, then they would send you to a college. And uh, your best field is where you would work. You'd be trained, you'd go to college, and you'd take college education classes. And the idea was to build up a cadre of young men who uh, would be able to go in after the war to the occupied countries and help build those countries back up. And all of the guys in there were, I'd say they're highly intelligent. But it wasn't long, within two months after arriving in Atlanta, Georgia, and we got there in January, that uh, rumors started to flow around that they were going to disband the whole program. And immediately I went to the Air Corps again and tried to get back in the Air Corps, and I was accepted for the Air Corps this time. Uh, but uh, it just wasn't soon enough. They disbanded the ASTP program and sent all of us to the infantry. They needed fighting people more than they need to, somebody to build up the country afterwards. So practically all of us were sent 
to infantry outfits. And I was sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to join the 100th Infantry Division. And we were spread all through that division. I was, went to B Company of the 399th Infantry Regiment of the 100th Division. And there we began our training all over again, the infantry training. I was placed in what they called the weapons platoon, which consisted of mortars and machine guns. And uh, I guess I had a special talent for a mortar. The idea is to set the mortar up and be able to have it firing uh, within a certain length of time. <clears throat> And me and several of my friends who would, uh, even after our regular training during the day, we'd, we'd get out in the back of the bar barracks and we'd take this mortar and we'd practice and we'd practice and we'd practice. The first time I set up a mortar for timing, a Sergeant DeLuca who was timing me, and he, he was telling everybody, he said, it'll, it'll probably take you about two minutes to set this up, this mortar up and have it ready to fire. When I set it up, I did it in 45 seconds. And he says, do that again. And I did, 40 seconds this time. The idea is to, the border's all strapped up, base plate on it. The idea is to unstrap it, throw the legs out, set the base plate in place, jam the legs in tight, and then start moving the different gears and levers on there until you get the bubbles all leveled and straight and you're sighted on a, an aiming stick. The upshot of it was I was able to do this within 15 seconds after a lot of practice. And my buddies could do the same thing. They were thinking of making me a sergeant at that time before I we went overseas. But then they brought in some other Air Corps people who already had the stripes so they made them a sergeant. I made good friends with a, a man by the name of Paul McCreary from College Corners, Ohio. He was uh, one of the riflemen in one of the platoons, rifle platoons. Uh, and we hit it off, good friends, we'd go swimming together and uh, just generally had a, a good time together. One night we were coming back from a picture show at the base theater and uh, as we were walking across the parade ground he said you know Ray he said I'm not coming back from overseas uh, I'd had a patriarchal blessing my patriarchal blessing said that I would be protected and I would come home and I said Paul what makes you feel that way why, why do you th feel that why do you say that? And he says, I don't know. He says, I just have the feeling within me that I'm just, I'm going to be one of the casualties. I'm never coming home. So anyway, we, we kept our friendship going and we saw as much of each other as we possibly could. We finally got received the orders to transfer out of Fort Bragg and go up to Fort Kilmer in New Jersey and we were sent up there ready to board ship. We were given a few days pass to go into New York City and, and look at New York City before we were shipped out. And then we were loaded up on our troop ship. The ship that we went on was the SS McAndrews. There was one of these big uh, storms come up the East Coast about the time that we shipped out. Uh, you know how rough the seas can be at that time with those big stores coming up through there. And so for the first three days, we were more or less battened down underneath uh, below decks. I understand from reading later in uh, the 100th Infantry book that uh, the SS McAndrews in going from side to side came within one degree of capsizing. It was that close. 
Anyway, we weathered the storm and uh, finally arrived in Marseille, France. And that's where we debarked about the 20th of October, 1944. <clears throat> uh, the 45th Infantry Division had been fighting all through, up through Italy and through North Africa and up through France. And they were tired. They were fighting in the Vosges Mountains in northern France. They were tired and they had to, they wanted to be, they had to be relieved. They were just, they'd been fighting for so long. So orders were sent down immediately to our division saying we need a combat team up on the front line just as fast as you can get them up there. And the combat team turned out to be the 399th Infantry Division, which I was in. We had to clean all of our weapons, get all the grease and everything off of them to protect them from the ocean air. We had to clean all those weapons and then get ready to move out. And within a week, we were being transported from Marseille up to the front lines. It took us three days to drive up through France to get to the Vosges Forest and the Vosges Mountains. And when I'm talking about forests, I mean forests. The regular forest that you're in, it's, it's not plain open mountains or anything like that. It's forest on these mountains, and this is what we're going to fight in. The night that we were supposed to go to go on to the front line, we relieved a B Company of the 45th Division. We're B Company, and so we're relieving B Company. And as we passed up, we saw a line of men going out as we went up the road. And it was so dark that you had to kind of hold on to the guy in front of you to see, to be able to find your way up this road. And we could hear the artillery firing, and as the shells went over our head, you could hear a sound like shh, 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 shh. These are the shells as they went over our head. And then you could hear them explode in the enemy lines. And as we were walking up the road, the men who were coming out would say, You'll be sorry, you'll be sorry. Because they knew what it was like up there. So we got up there and we got into the front lines. We stayed there for several days, getting more or less acclimated to the to the terrain and to what was happening. They sent patrols out They'd come back and to find out where the German lines were. And then we, we set out to attack a, a, a place called San Rome. And as we were moving through the forest, we happened to come to an open field outside of the, the city of San Rome. And uh, we were spread out in, so we're going across this field quite, you know, a ways apart from each other. And I was over on the right side and I was keeping an eye on the company commander who was over on my left side. And we stopped, the whole thing stopped for a minute. I was underneath a tree and uh, I had my mortar sitting on the ground in front of me. And I was watching him, and all of a sudden he raised his rifle and aimed it straight at me. And uh, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I yelled, yelled everybody around me, hit the ground. And I did, and as soon as I hit the ground, the bullet hit the, wind, the tree right where I'd been standing. And then, of course, the rest of the company, being new to war, <laughs> opened up on us too. And it took us a while to calm them down and say, hey, we're your side. So that finally stopped and as we were go going into the outskirts of town, we was going through a cabbage patch and I was next to the captain, company commander. And I said, Lieutenant Prince, uh, why'd you shoot at me? And he says, I thought you were a German with his German gas mask canister at his feet. He's a West Point man. So he was just as nervous as the rest of us. 
as we began to enter the town, the German artillery came in and, and uh, really saturated the town. And when that stopped, we moved on forward, and, and that's when I saw Paul McCurry. Paul McCurry and uh, Sergeant Albano were the first two men in our company who were killed. This is my best friend. I saw Paul, one foot blown off, still in a shoe off to one side. Best friend. And I cried. I, I didn't know what else to do. But there is nothing you can do. They're dead. They're gone. But I'll always remember Paul McCreary. Maybe that's why I called you Paul. I don't know. Named you Paul. Might have been after Paul Andrews, but I'm not sure. Uh, from that point on, uh, we were in a number of horrendous battles. We continually kept pushing and pushing against the Germans and driving them back and driving them back and until we finally reached one spot that was killed called Hill 514. Uh, the Germans were on top of this hill or small mountain and it had a, a good viewpoint for the entire surrounding area, all of the Bosch mountain area. And they could see every place from up where they were up there. And we, we were given the, the objective of taking this hill. The uh, company commander figured if we went up the steepest part, there probably wouldn't be as much artillery or machine guns or resistance to our attack. So that's where the way we went. We went up the steepest part. Now, this is November now, and uh, it's it's been raining quite constantly, and it's the, the, the ground is muddy, it's slippery, and it's uh, there's some snow in patches. It's, uh, it's, it was just a horrendous battle as we went up this hill. And as you go up the hill, you see your buddies, there's people laying off to one side dead. And there's, uh, they look so much different when they're dead than when they're alive. But you can't stop, you have to keep going, you have to keep fighting up this hill. And all you can hear is men yelling and and machine gun fire and rifle firing. Uh, your goal is to get up to the top. Get up to the top and get there the best way you can. Some of the, the company did make it to the top, but we didn't. Uh, by the dark fall, by the time nightfall. And so we were forced to stay on the side of the mountain and not move around. Uh, it was cold that night, very, very cold. Uh, during the battle, it was very, very hot. You wondered, uh, it's perspire, and it was, I mean, it was terribly hot as you fought your way up that, and, but that night it was very, very cold. There's a German close to us who was, had been wounded, and we couldn't very much move around, and. It, try to help him, I could hear him uh, calling out Hilfe, 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 which is help. Hilfe mir, help me. <clears throat> the next morning he was dead. We finally made it to the top of this hill. And then we drove the Germans off and we now had control of the top of this hill. And in doing that, we had broken what was called the German Northern Defensive Line. Once we took that hill, then we made it able for us to break out and hit the Alsace-Lorraine plains and push the Germans further back. As soon as we got to the top, 
the German artillery team in. We, we got up there, we dug our foxholes in our defensive positions, and then the artillery came in, and the artillery lasted for three days, just continual bombardment. And all we could do was stay in our holes. We defecated in these holes. We did everything in these holes. But we stayed in them, otherwise we'd get killed. One man uh, went crazy. Finally jumped out of the hole and started running around on top of the hill. We had to send him down off the side of the hill and down to a med station. Anyway, we had opened up the way into Germany to the northern part of France. And we began to push our way for the next a little while, uh, for three days straight, I guess we must have traveled 25 miles every day just pushing the Germans, just chasing them through the hills and the countryside. Finally, we reached a place called San Louis de Vichy. Uh, Paul's been there. Uh, this is where they have a glass factory or a crystal factory. We stayed there for about two days. And I, from San Louis de Vichy is where I sent the crystal home to uh, your mom and my mother. December the 7th, we were supposed to attack the town of Lemberg, Lemberg, Germany, France. <clears throat> it was kind of a, to me, my way of thinking, it was kind of a stupid way to attack this town. We were in the forest off the main road down below and we come up through the forest and then there's an open field, wide open field, and across, splitting it in the middle of the road going from one from the right to the left. Uh, then beyond that there was another open field. By the, the road there was a ditch. The Germans were in the town on the other side of this next open field. And I'm talking maybe about uh, 200 yards for the first field to the road and another 200 yards up to the town. Uh, open field. November, as you see, December. Ground is hard, hard as a rock. Frozen. And we start out in what's called a skirmish line. You've seen these Patriot film where you said that the Americans fighting in rows and the British coming the other way. This is what it was on it just us on the skirmish line heading towards this town. The first and third platoons went out first. They made it as far as the road. And then we began to move out too. I was in the sec the fourth platoon, so the second and fourth now came out. And we got about halfway up this first field, when the Germans opened up, they caught both of the, the two skirmish lines out in the open. The entire front of the, the town that we could see, from one side to the other, they had machine guns, 20 millimeter guns, mortars, flak wagons, everything you can imagine, were now directed against us and were out in that open field. The only thing we can do is, is hit flat onto the ground. The uh, first and third platoons were able to duck down and were able to worm our way back into the ditch so they had some cover. But we were caught dead to rights out in the open field. And uh, the bullets and the shells that were coming through us were dropping a lot of men. I saw one man's head taken off with a 20 millimeter. Uh, we had a mortar. A mortar is, you can put the sights in upside down and still manipulate it laying flat on the ground. So I called back to my, my gunner and uh, the people back there with the mortar. I says, set the mortar up turn the sights upside down. We have to have an aiming stake. And I 
didn't want to put up a stake or anything of that sort. I said, use me as the aiming stake. Sight, oh, excuse my language, put your sights on the crack of my ass. And I'll scoot side to side for the targets. And this is what they did. Now, I had a good crew. I had the binoculars, and I could tell where the shells were coming from. And we took out a machine gun nest first. And I scooted over, and then we took out a mortar nest. And I scooted again, and we took out another machine gun nest, and then we took a black wagon out. But by this time, we had drawn attention to ourselves. Finally, when darkness fell, uh, the rest of the company started straggling back. We lost about a third of our company that day. And, uh, but the next night, the next night we went in with tanks and we took the town. The next night I was in a, the basement of a building inside of, of Limburg and, uh, and uh, before we could put a light I, had, I started to put a shelter half up over the window and a shell lit on the outside of the window and threw, <laughs> blew me clear across the room. So many times my patriarchal blessing came to, to life and saved us. I could tell that the Lord was still watching over me and my life was being spared. Didn't even get scratches in these things, you know. See men killed all around me and I wasn't even, no scratches, no nothing happening to me. Well, we were pulled out of uh, the fighting and put into reserve for a few days until our company was built back up again with more replacements. And then we went on the attack again, this time against the city, towards the city of Bisha, Bisha, France, which was an anchor point on the Maginot Line. <clears throat> on November the 21st, 1944, your mother wrote me a letter. I'm going to read that letter. Now, remember, she's only 18 years old. This is a girl, 18 years old, who's pouring out her heart. So, hope I can get through the letter. Dear Ray, in a twisted up world like today, it just doesn't pay to have pride. That is why I'm going to say this. I love you more than ever. I've never been very religious or even went to church, but I pray for you every night. You don't tell me very much of how awful it really is. I wish you would feel free to do so. I mean. I want to know, believe me, if whenever you do get a chance once in a million to write letters, I imagine you already do this, but I want you to know that I'll understand anyhow, write to your mother, if no one else. What I mean is, can you understand, as wonderful as it is to receive a letter from you, please leave mine and write to her. I can at least get some information from her. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. In most of my letters, I chabber on about what, I, what fun I had, bowling or some other full thing. Well, I've lied at times, some of those times. I didn't have any fun at all. For a while I go along all right, then I start thinking of where you are and what you're doing, it just isn't fair. I read once <clears throat> where you weren't supposed to write letters like this, that all letters should be cheery and full of fun, but I'm, I can't help it if I need you so badly that sometimes there's just no cheery attitude there. I've always been afraid of being laughed at, but please don't laugh at the childish ways that I put things. 
I had a horrible time at work today, just couldn't seem to settle down. A lot more went into the wastebasket than in the mail. Truthfully, if I were the boss, I'd hired a girl as dumb as I, I would have fired her by now. And I'm not trying to be modest. You should see some of the dippy things I do. <laughs> Guess I should tell you some of the news around town as long as I'm here. Article 1. We are to celebrate Thanksgiving this Thursday, November the 23rd, 1944, in this state anyway. Article 2. It is still awfully cold here, but I don't imagine it's half as cold as where you are. Article 3. Beth Howard has a baby boy. Article 4. My bus was 20 minutes late this morning. The bus driver simply slept in. Article 5. I love you very much. Article 6. I love you very much. Article 7. I love you very much. No, my pen didn't hit in a rut. Honestly, Ray, I do think we should have an understanding. Uh, no, don't hold your breath. Just because I make a fool of myself and don't care anymore a bit what I say, don't feel a bit obligated. <laughs> because I want you to say what you think, whether it is what I want to hear or not. Go to page five. Didn't realize I was going to so deep. <clears throat> and also, just because I say I love you, is this the fifth or the sixth time? I don't want you to write back the same thing, all mushy like this, if you don't want to, or even if you do. I'm having a, the damnedest time getting a clear explaining, explaining, explanation, understanding, or etc. This is probably the sloppiest letter you ever received. But at least you will have to admit it is to the point. I certainly double-crossed myself. In the first paragraph, I said I wasn't coming to a clear explanation. In the second paragraph, I admit coming straight to the point. It is just one of those things, I suppose. I have a suggestion. Let's pretend you are home, and we are going to the roof at the Hotel Utah. Of course, we will have to change the seasons, too, or wear some earmuffs. Okay, I've got on my highest heels and the stoutest perfume, and you have on your nicest suit, nice and blue in color. We'll have to hurry, or we'll miss the bus. Gas shortage, you know. Well, we made it, and are now dancing cheek to cheek in each other's arms. As I mentioned before, it's cold outside, and all the time we are dancing, I keep kissing you whether you like it or not. I don't care because I'm enjoying myself. 18 years old now, listen. Then and then we go bowling. <laughs> ah, the perfect evening and then hurrying to catch the 11.30 p.m. bus and home. Good night, all my love and etc. Shirley. <laughs> I couldn't keep many letters. You can't when you're fighting in the, in, an infantryman. But I kept this letter in my pocket. And you see how I had it folded? How it ended up? That's the part that was on the outside. That's Shirley when she was 18. And that's us when we were married in 1945. Okay, we're back at Bishay. We could hear things happening down in the town. The railroad was being very active. We could hear tanks in the town. We could hear uh, lots of activity going on, and we knew that something was going to happen. Uh, we were deeply entrenched in the hills. We had good fortifications. Uh, but, and we, they decided that on uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's night, they're going to send a big artillery barrage in and we'd celebrate New Year's. 
the Germans uh, decided uh, otherwise. 11.30, New Year's Eve night, 11.30 p.m. They hit our lines with force. I mean, they, they came at us with everything they had. We were kept busy that night. Uh, uh, my mortar crews were, uh, we'd, we'd fire flares in the air to keep light up the countryside so we could see what was happening. And in between, we'd, we'd throw shells into where we, they were needed to help stop the advance. Uh, we held. Nobody was able to get through our lines that night. It was like a, the Germans hitting a brick wall. Uh, nobody slept that night, of course. It was continual attack all night long. But in the morning, uh, I received word from my uh, platoon commander, uh, Lieutenant Snow, uh, through uh, Sergeant DeLuca, that I was to take, he had received word from Captain Prince that uh, the command post was on, under attack, they needed help to evacuate, and could, the, the, could they send help down. So I was told to take my squad and uh, go down to the company command post and help them evacuate. And this I did, I got my crew together, my squad together, and we, we went down as we approached the company command post. We found that it was being attacked from three sides. The only side open was the side that we were coming in on. And uh, we opened up, we opened fire on the two sides that we could see and were able to work our way into the command post and then we took up positions inside the command post to hold the Germans off while the, the, the uh, headquarters people loaded up the three jeeps that they had and uh, were able to get out of there. They went south through the forest to get away from the Germans. We had a second objective at that time. After helping the command post to evacuate, we were supposed to then blow trees down across the road to form a roadblock, stop tanks, things to come. So we set about doing that. Some of our men would, would hold the Germans off while we'd set shape charges against the trees and blow the trees down across the road. One thing the captain didn't tell me, and I didn't know this until just a few years ago, he had called our own artillery and told them to saturate the area where the command post was with our own artillery. Uh, he neglected to tell me that. So, we had finished blowing the last tree down when all of a sudden the most horrendous artillery barrage that you ever can imagine fell on our position. We're in the forest. I could see trees being snapped off at the top and being blown out of the ground. Uh, the, the noise was just was just terrible. And we began to run. We didn't have any choice. We began to run towards our lines up on the hill. And uh, as we were running, I, uh, the snow would be about this deep around us. As we were trying to run through this and get out of the artillery barrage, uh, suddenly I found myself kneeling in the snow. And the first thought that came to my mind was, uh, what are you doing kneeling here in the ground? Get up, you gotta get out of here. But I couldn't get up. And they, laying next to me was Kirby Perryman. And he was, had one whole side practically blown away. 
massive wounds. Still alive, but massive wounds. Uh, squad gathered around me and uh, a medic gave both Kirby and I a shot of morphine. And uh, this only took seconds. And uh, I, I said to him, go, get out of here. You've got to go. And they, they hesitated. It's, that's only natural. It's, they're told to leave somebody and they didn't want to. These are infantrymen. Their buddy is their buddy. You don't leave your buddy. But if they had stayed there, they'd been killed. So I swore at them. Told them to get the hell out of there. Go. I said, you can't help me. You can't help Kirby. Get out of here. Save yourselves. And so they left. I think they all got back. I don't haven't heard that any of them were hurt or anything like that, but they were able to get out. And there I'm left with Kirby. I had a, a sleeping bag and I moved over to Kirby and all the time this shelling's still going on. I don't know how in the world I ever got, didn't get hit again. Patriarchal blessing? I don't know. I moved over to Kirby and I took my sleeping bag and I covered him with it and he says, Ray, he says, I'm gone. You get out of here too. I said, no, I'm not going to leave you. And he said, there's nothing you can do. And he closed his eyes. I think he passed out at that point. And there wasn't, there wasn't anything I could do. So I began to crawl away. Uh, have you ever been alone? I mean, really alone? That's how I was. Look back and see Kirby back there, and I was leaving a friend who had depended on me. He was one of my squad. I couldn't help him. There's nobody around that I could go to, turn to. My squad was gone, cut me for all I knew was being decimated. It's just me. I was the only one there. I would crawl and I'd pass out, and I'd crawl and I'd pass out. Eventually, when I'd wake up, uh, the artillery was gone. I could see Germans running past me. And they were, weren't paying any attention to me, I guess because of the blood and everything else that was around me, they probably thought I was dead. But uh, they were running on past me. And uh, I made it to the company command post. I didn't get it back, get back to the company, but I did find the company command post and I went inside, this, it was a farm building. And I went into the farm building and went downstairs, crawled downstairs and found a, a bed down there. It was, happened to turn out to be a feather bed. Uh, I found some candles, I lit the candles and they were up on, put them up on a shelf and I took all of my weapons that I had and put them up on a shelf too. And then got over, made it over to the bed, fell onto it and passed out. Now this was all happening in the morning and uh, I don't know how long I was unconscious, but uh, when I did awaken, the candles had gone out, and I could hear thumping upstairs. Uh, heavy boots, German-type boots. So nothing I could do I to wait for them to come down, find me in the basement. Now you've got to understand something. Uh, 
if you're an infantryman and you go into a building and before you ever go into a room that hasn't been cleared, you'll throw a hand grenade or something like that into that room, make sure it's cleared. Or else you'll put your gun around there and spray the room with bullets. Neither of these things happened. I could hear them coming down the steps. The steps came this way and then turned to the, the left and then came into the basement. I could see the light coming down. And then a light came through. And then a light came over and shone on me. And I expected then that they were going to shoot, but they didn't. And they, well, I was captured by the German Wehrmacht, which was the People's Army. Uh, they had a medic with them. They brought the medic in. The medic came over and checked my wounds, gave me a shot of tetanus, and he stayed with me all that night. Uh, we taught. Uh, I'd pass out on occasion. When I woke up in the morning, uh, he told me that the, some tankers had come in and wanted to take me out and shoot me, but he wouldn't let them do it. So he stayed with me all the next day on the 2nd of January, and then that night they loaded me into a lorry and took me 30 kilometers to the north across the, the border into to Germany. We were taken to uh, uh, Spreibrücken, yeah, two bridges. <clears throat> and there was a hospital there. I stayed in the hospital for three days. Uh, one day they did operate on my back, cleaned it up, didn't take out any shrapnel or anything of that sort, but they cleaned that up and then they uh, put a cardboard bandage on it, about all they had. And uh, several days later I was loaded into a, another lorry with about eight men and we were taken to Neustadt, Germany. Uh, Neustadt on der Weinstrasse. It was a sort of a, 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 a war hospital. We were taken, put on the top floor and were kept there for about almost a week. And during that time, some of our American planes would come over and they'd strafe this building. And we'd jump under the beds when it, that happened. Then we were finally taken from there and, and transported to Heppenheim, Germany. We were put into a building which was a former psychiatric hospital, a former insane asylum. It was surrounded by high walls. The, Ger the German commandant and the German surgeon hated Americans, and that's, that's all that came in to uh, Heppenheim during the month of January, about 330 Americans, all of us very badly wounded. The ones on the third floor were really bad, they were bed cases. They were kept confined to their beds up on the third floor. And there were two American uh, doctors there who were also POWs. One was a major and one was a captain. And they took care of those men on the third floor. They didn't have any medical supplies or anything of that sort, but they did everything they could to keep these men alive. And they would count off every morning to see who wasn't there. Uh, I didn't know know about them until much later. I was on the first floor. And I was put into a room with nine other men. It was just a, a we were crowded in there. It was uh, as soon as I walked into that room, I couldn't I, I couldn't believe my nostrils. It, all you could smell was was. Uh, pus and vomit and feces and, and blood and uh, uh, I mean it was just a terrible smell but eventually you get used to that it wasn't a bad smell after a while the German guards would never come into the room because of the smell uh, we were left pretty much on our own we weren't uh, beaten or anything of that sort, it was just left alone. The, the German commandant and the, 
surgeon uh, did everything they could to uh, help us along as far as dying is concerned. Our food consisted of one, one loaf of bread for the, the ten of us, which amounted to about two ounces in the morning. It was about that square and about that thick. A piece of bread in the morning. At night we'd get a watery potato soup. Never saw potatoes in it. Or peelings for that matter, but it tasted good. So we lived on bread and water, essentially. I'd say about 125 calories per day. It wasn't long before you're hungry. I used to save the crusts off my piece of bread. And I put them in my parka that I had. And then I would sneak them out on a Sunday morning and eat them. And I mean, you'd have to sneak them out. If they knew you had extra bread, they'd come after you. So I'd sneak them out of my pocket and bring them up and eat them like this. The only problem with that is the fact that uh, we were th the lice in the, this hospital. We were just covered with lice and they would be in my pockets too. So if I snuck out a piece of bread to eat, I was sure eating lice at the same time. I stopped that. It was too dangerous to do that. I tried to limit myself as far as going to the bathroom was concerned on the assumption that if I just left everything in me, I wouldn't get so hungry. But after doing that for a week, then it's, it's pure torture trying to get rid of the waste. So here we were. We were being starved. We had lice. Uh, we had no medical facilities. They wouldn't change our bandages, they wouldn't do anything as far as medicine was concerned. They didn't really care. Either live or die, That's, that was a, the principle. I made friends with a, a Frenchman who had been a medic in the French army and he had been a prisoner for about four years since the fall of France. And he came around and uh, he saw I was writing on a piece of paper one time, he wouldn't know what I was doing and I was what I was doing was writing down the logarithmic terms for sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. And the, the relationship that these have with one another, I was just doing this to keep my mind active and, and take it off of how hungry I was. And he saw that and he looked at that and he ran out of the room and he came back and he gave me a, a French geometry book. I still have it, it's down in the basement of my house. Uh, he came into me one day and he says, Ray, you stink. <laughs> I said, I know I stink. I said, everybody in this room stinks. So what's, what's the big deal? And he says, yeah, but you stink the worst. He says, you have gangrene. And it must be taken care of. And I must get the, the surgeon to operate on you and take that out. And I'd heard about the surgeon. Everybody in the camp knew what the surgeon did. He had used something like a cattle dehorner. You know what that a pair of clippers? He'd use a cattle dehorner to cut off fingers and toes. He'd use a hacksaw to cut off your hands or your feet. He'd use a regular saw to cut off a leg or whatever. And all this without benefit of any anesthesia at all. So I didn't want to go to the surgeon. And he said, you must. If you don't go to the surgeon, you will die. So he made arrangements. The next day he came and got me, and he took me upstairs to the second room. And as he got to the room, you'd see a boxes of arms and legs and feet, toes, out in the hallway. Terrible smell. And he said, uh, don't worry, I'll be with you. And we went into the room and he had a big argument with the, the surgeon. The surgeon wanted him to leave and he refused to leave. He was, was not going to go. 
He wasn't going to leave me in there alone. So finally the surgeon said, oh, I indicated that I should be put on the edge of a table and four guards held my legs and feet and he went around behind me and began to cut. I'd say that he worked on me for about 45 minutes. As soon as he started to cut, uh, I, I guess I had a shocked look on my face and he made, grabbed my face with his hands like so. And he says, it's okay. He says, I'll, I'm here. It'll be okay. And he stayed that way for the full time. And me saved my life twice that day. First, for insisting that I go and have the gangrene taken out, and second, by staying in that room. When the surgeon got through, he, he went down below where he had been working, and he cut up through my back and put a drain in so everything, all that stuff would drain out. And then he put a cardboard bandage on it and hit me on the shoulder and says, Give egg go away. Within a week it started to itch and I knew I was healing up. Well, that's, that was how it was in Heppenheim. I was there for 87 days altogether, not quite 90 days. Uh, I lost 60 pounds altogether went from 180 down to 120. Uh, skin and bones, uh, you'd see the other guys, the skin would just hang off their buttocks. You know, they're, all of us were just skin and bones. Uh, we never saw any bombers in Heppenheim. We could hear the bombers hitting the town of Worms across, which was uh, west across the Rhine. We'd hear the bombers and all the thumping as the drone bombs dropped on birds, but Heppenheim was just a small village on the east side of the Rhine. Never saw a bomber, but uh, about uh, 10 days or so before we were liberated, the American planes arrived. And we heard them first. We saw them flying through the skies. Uh, and then we heard one of them come down and was strafing the road out in front of the prison. It was called Ludwigstrasse, I think. <clears throat> anyway, as soon as that happened, all of a sudden we heard uh, shouting and pounding in the, the hallways, and German guards were coming down and throwing the door doors to some of the rooms open and were, uh, he grabbed about 10 of us out of our rooms and shoved us up down the hallway and out into the grounds and they were beating us with clubs and the rifle butts and the rifle barrels and driving us across the courtyard to go out the gate and out to the street. Uh, if you fell down they'd just beat you more until you got up. So here we arrive out in the street, all bloody and bruised, and and uh, the German commandant's waiting out there with a, and he's angry because evidently some German soldiers have been killed during the strafing, and he waded into all of us with a riding crop, just whipping the crop back and forth, hitting us all, and then he indicated to his guards to put us against the wall. And there we are standing against the wall and he sent his guards across the road with their rifles and he's just about ready to shoot us. I mentioned the two German doctors, or American doctors. The major came out and confronted the German commandant who was also a major, Major Siegler. And he said, if you shoot these men, you might as well shoot every one of us. And somebody's going to live. 
and they'll tell what happened here. He says, you have no right to shoot these prisoners. They haven't done anything to you. Anyway, they argued for about 15 minutes and finally the German commandant told the firing squad to put their rifles down and take us back inside and we were beat all the way back into our rooms again. I'm going to tell you something now that uh, I'm not very proud of. I had received a, a patriarchal blessing and the patriarchal blessing said something like this. You will be in the service of your country in which your life will be in great mortal danger. But have no fear, your life will be spared. Heroism on the field of battle will glorify you in the sight of man. Marrying one of God's beautiful daughters and raising up children unto the Lord will glorify you in the eyes of the Lord. Your life will be spared. What do you think when you're looking across the road that 10 rifles were pointing, looked like they're all pointing right at you? I lost my faith. Uh, the only thing I could think of is what is my mother going to say? And what is Shirley going to say? When I got back in my room, we wouldn't talk to each other, the ones that had been beaten and taken out there. That night when I had horrible dreams, only this time the rifle shot, fired. And I blamed God. I blamed him for the situation that I was in. I said, why in the world do you let these things happen? Why are these men suffering so much? Why am I suffering so much? Blame God for my situation. <sighs> well, I'm sure that he's forgiven me for that. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have allowed me to do the things that I've done, such as working in a temple or, or whatever. But it's, uh, it's nothing to be proud of that I, that I turned against God. Anyway, 10 days later, we were liberated. Uh, the two American doctors got hold of the, I don't think they found the surgeon, but they did get hold of the, the commandant and some of the guards and they locked him in a room. They had means of receiving information from outside the walls. I don't know what that means was, but they, they knew what was happening and how soon the German Americans would be there. And on the 27th of March, 1945, we were liberated. And B came to me and he says, I would like to, you to go with me into the village and uh, visit a family that I know there. So I said, okay, I'll go with you. And so we went into the village and we were knocked on this one door, a quaint little house, and uh, two women were in there and they just threw their arms around him. Evidently he had helped them in different situations. And they were crying on his shoulder and telling him that they didn't know where their husbands were. One was the daughter and one was the mother. And both their husbands had been fighting on the Eastern Front against the Russians. They didn't know where they were. So we stayed there for, for a little bit and then they gave us some eggs. And as we were walking back to the, the camp, we passed an army uh, kitchen, infantry kitchen. You could smell the bread. And I walked up to the the sergeant, the head cook, and I said, "Hey, Sarge, how about letting us have 
one loaf of white bread. My friend here hasn't had white bread in four years. And he says, who in the hell are you? <laughs> and I pulled out my dog tags and I said, to him, my name is Sergeant Ray Howard. I was in B Company, 399th Infantry Regiment, 100th Infantry Division. Just recently, a member of that building over there. And he said, oh, hell. How many loaves do you want? <laughs> I said, just one loaf, that's all. We took one loaf of bread and we went back and fried those eggs and had bread and eggs. Uh, a lot of the men that day got candy and stuff off of the troops. And three or four of them died that night from overeating. I mean, their stomachs couldn't take it. I was transported back into to France. Now this was in, in March, and from March until I was released from the army in November, I was in some type of a hospital, rehabilitation hospital, rehab, something to build me back up to what I was dormant. And during that time, of course, I married your mother. Uh, when I, after we'd been married for a while, maybe in early 1946, a newspaper article came out in the Salt Lake Tribune, or Deseret News. It was a syndicated or, or article out of the Washington Post. And it said, heroes are cowards. And it was talking about POWs. And he tended, the writer tended to call POWs cowards because we allowed ourselves to be captured so that we could spend our the rest of the war in relative ease and comfort. I knew I wasn't a coward but I didn't know what anybody else would think. So I made the decision then that I would never tell anybody that I was a prisoner of war. Least of all my family, you know. And so I wouldn't talk about the war, I wouldn't talk about prison camp, I wouldn't talk about anything. None of the people I worked with during the time that I was working for Bethlehem Steel knew that I'd been a prisoner of war. They might have known I was in the army, but they didn't know what. They just knew that fact. Not what part of the army, what I'd been in. And I suffered from it, and my family suffered from it. All of you suffered from it, didn't you? I'm sorry for that. But thank Phil Christensen and Mitzi Wasserstein for turning me around. I'm a different man than what you grew up with. Much different man.